And I now want to share with you the current evidence, the fundamental studies that allow us to say that hypothermia works after cardiac arrest. Now, before I tell you about the studies, some of you are not healthcare providers taking this course. And I wanted to explain a little bit what is a randomized trial. You may have heard of this term in the media. So I want to take a moment, healthcare providers, forgive this diversion. What does a randomized trial look like? Well, randomized isn't completely random. What it means is patients are either given a therapy or not given a therapy, and you don't know what you're going to do until you randomize them, until you choose which arm of the study they're going to be in. So let me explain what I mean. In the setting of cardiac arrest, a study might look like this, and these are the randomized trials I'll share with you. An arrest victim is transported by ambulance to an emergency department in a hospital. Now, in that emergency department, they are then randomized, essentially a coin is flipped, and they are either treated with hypothermia or not treated with hypothermia. Now, this can only be done in situations where it's ethically felt if, if, that we don't know if a therapy works. If we knew that cooling worked, it wouldn't be ethical to not give that therapy to patients. Well, the studies that were done before these randomized trials were not definitive, and so it was felt ethical because we didn't know if hypothermia would work. Indeed, there's potential risks from whole body cooling. So in the studies I will share with you, victims were randomized to cooling or no cooling, and then outcomes were assessed. So patients were cared for in the hospital, and at the end, the question was, how many patients survived and how well did they survive in each of these groups or arms of the study. Okay, so that's what a randomized trial of post-arrest cooling looks like. Now, there are, as I mentioned, several randomized trials. These were all done within the last 10 years, so this is fairly new stuff and very exciting because they really catapulted hypothermia into the modern consciousness. The first study I'll share with you about briefly is called the Hypothermia After Cardiac Arrest Trial, or the HACA trial. Now, in the HACA trial, patients randomized to cooling were cooled to 32 degrees Celsius, so again, mild hypothermia, and they were kept cold for 24 hours for one day once they reached that goal temperature, and then they were rewarmed. And the thinking here was that if you cool patients for a certain period of time, the injury processes settle down, and resuscitation uh, can then proceed with inflammation and reactive oxygen species and mitochondrial injury having been uh, uh, attenuated, having been lessened. The other randomized trial uh, was performed in Australia by Stefan Bernard and his colleagues. Um, both of these studies, by the way, were published in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. In the Bernard study, patients were also cooled to 32 degrees Celsius, but in this case only for 12 hours. Interesting difference. They felt maybe a shorter period of cooling was all you needed. Now, I'll briefly mention a third trial. Uh, this was a much smaller study, um, and it was to test a new technology of a cooling cap that people would have placed on their skull, on their scalp, I should say. And this study also cooled patients to 32, but only for four hours. Now, I'm not going to talk more. I just wanted to mention that study. The top two are the main two studies that looked at post-arrest cooling. Um, and it's important to note up front, we're going to get to this in a little bit of detail, that these trials only rolled patients who had shockable arrest rhythms. Now, those of you who joined me for the first two lectures learned a lot about shockable and not shockable arrest rhythms. Just to refresh you, hearts have different rhythms of cardiac arrest, and, and these are two rhythms that are shockable, meaning they need a defibrillation attempt to restore heart function. These are rhythms known as ventricular fibrillation, VFib or VF, if you will, and ventricular tachycardia, or VT. If the heart has either of these rhythms, they need a shock. And these two trials only enrolled patients with shockable rhythms. Now, you might wonder why. There's a specific reason why. These are the patients most likely to survive cardiac arrest. As you learned from the prior lectures, asystole, which is known as flatline in the media, if you have a flatline, no electrical activity, you're unlikely to survive. Those are patients you don't want to study because no matter what you do, they're going to do poorly. So this will become important in a moment. This is what cooling looks like. So what you see here is a temperature curve, temperature on the y-axis, time and hours on the x-axis. And this dot is going to move as the patient moves through cooling and rewarming. So the patient gets cooled, and then they get rewarmed. That is the basic sequence of hypothermia after cardiac arrest. Now, in summary, this is what the trials found. In the HACA trial, 
survival was much better in the group that got cooled. In the Bernard trial, also, survival was much better in the group that got cooled. And it should be mentioned that these numbers only include patients who recovered with a working brain. So we're not just talking about survival, we're talking about both survival and neurologic recovery. Now, in the third study, the smaller study of the cooling cap, a very dramatic improvement in survival with hypothermia. Again, a much smaller study. But suffice to say that these are now three studies that show an improvement in survival when cooling is applied following cardiac arrest. So, very dramatic evidence, and perhaps the best evidence for anything we have in resuscitation medicine. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about the, what's called the resuscitation guidelines process, or the CPR guidelines that we all use when we learn CPR, and what they did about this evidence around hypothermia. Well, the way this works is every five years, a group of experts get together under the auspices of the American Heart Association. And actually, I should be formally correct here. It's actually under the auspices of an international group called the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, of which AHA is a participant. I say that for those of you in Europe or Asia who are watching this today, and I don't want to offend any of you. It's ILCOR that comes up with these guidelines. It's an international group with international experts. It's usually held in the United States, and they have a closed meeting where all the evidence in the last five years is reviewed and new guidelines are created. These are the guidelines that inform all the CPR courses worldwide. And these manuals are derived from these meetings. Now, in 2005, hypothermia first entered the guidelines based on the evidence I shared with you, and it was updated in 2010. And here's what the guidelines say. If a patient has a cardiac arrest from either V-fib or V-tac, those shockable rhythms, because that's, after all, what the randomized trials used in their study, the AHA recommends that you cool these people with what's called a Class I recommendation. Now, some of you may not be familiar with what this means. I don't blame you. Um, it's a little bit of a technical parlance. Class I is the ill core's way of saying you should cool these patients. Um, it, it's sort of, it's as close as this group of people comes to saying you must do it. Of course, it's not a regulatory group. This isn't like a law. Uh, it's a recommendation from a scientific body. So it's their strongest recommendation. So if a doctor gets a patient after a V-fib arrest, they should be cooled. Now, if someone has the other heart rhythms, like a pulseless electrical activity or asystole, in other words, rhythms that are not shockable, they give it what's called a class 2B recommendation. Um, what this means in American Heart Association parlance is maybe you should cool, maybe you shouldn't, we don't really know. And this is a big challenge, actually, in modern healthcare provision, um, is what to do about these patients. Many hospitals actually cool these patients, um, but there is some debate about this. But certainly patients with VF or VTAC should be cooled.